Hey, welcome back to Well That's Interesting. The yet another amazing thing about the creatures around us, I'm kind of losing track, edition. Today is episode 203. Y'all, sperm whales have their own phonetic alphabet, and honeybees can detect lung cancer by scent. My friends, just two short weeks ago, we covered a groundbreaking study on the African savanna elephant that revealed their low frequency infrasound rumbles are jam packed with information. And somewhere in those calls are names. Yeah, elephants have names for each other. Researchers from Colorado State University and the nonprofit Save the Elephants and Elephant Voices gathered audio recordings of wild herds roaming within two of Kenya's national parks. And they did this from 1986 to 2022. 36 years of recordings yielded a whopping 469 rumbles, each believed to be directed towards different recipient elephants. Now, if you had to listen to episode 201, then you know what ingenious measures researchers took next. With hundreds of calls, each too low for our human ears to fully pick up, they relied on AI and machine learning for assistance. What they found was that their model was able to predict the correct elephant recipient of a call nearly 30% of the time. Something was in those calls for the AI to pick up on. Then, researchers relied on some good old-fashioned field work where calls were played back to certain elephants in the wild. My friends, they responded to the calls researchers believed somewhere within the frequency, their name was embedded. They responded to it. It was awesome. There was physical confirmation. In the first half of this show, we are leaving the largest land mammal for one of the largest ocean mammals, sperm whales. In a remarkably similar approach, researchers from the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory and Project SETI, which we'll get into, they recently used algorithms to decode literally thousands of these animals' clicks and pops, all to discover, well, they're not just random or repetitive clicks and pops. Now, I'm not going to give it away. I'm not going to give the details away here. Let's just say they have far more nuanced communication than previously thought. Then after the break, honeybees. Yeah, again, these little life-giving fuckers are just full of surprises. Way back, way, way back in episode 071, we learned that honeybees use social distancing to protect themselves against parasites. Yeah, you heard me right. When researchers introduced a mite with a name straight out of a Mad Max prequel, this mite named Varroa Destructor, when they released it into a honeybee hive, one behavior, their foraging dances, which can increase mite transmission due to touch, this occurred less frequently in central parts of the hive. It appears foragers move towards the periphery of the nest, while nurses and groomer bees move towards the center in response to an infestation. And this is all to increase the distance between the two groups. It's brilliant. In episode 186, we learned that older sister bees teach younger bees how to correctly perform that foraging dance, which is also called the wag the waggle dance. Like, I get... I just want to eat it. Okay, anyway, if that all sounds adorable to you, it is. If you haven't had a listen, you should. Maybe later today. Because first, you're going to want to hear the latest. Laboratory experiments suggest honeybees can identify lung cancer using their sense of smell. Talk about life-giving. We will get into the experiment which made this discovery, including the teeny 3D printed plastic harnesses involved. We will get into just how accurate their detection levels are and what this could mean for the human healthcare system. Spoiler, 
You can get results in real time and the cost of care could actually be affordable. We will get to it. In the meantime, hi, I'm Jill Chacha. And if this is your first time listening, welcome to The Flock, my rejuvenating business goose. To begin, I'm going to need you to stock up on some sunscreen and to fill your luggage with scandalous swimwear, because I've just booked us a non-stop flight to the stunning mountainous Caribbean island nation of Dominica. And for my fellow geographically challenged Americans who are pumped to go but are like, where is this exactly? Don't worry, I've got you. Please, everyone, briefly imagine Florida. Perfect, thank you. Now point to its most southern tip. Okay, and move your finger farther south, just about 90 miles. Okay, there is Cuba. From here, I'd like you to draw a comma. And as you do, you'll hit the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, the British Virgin Islands, and then, voila, Dominica. Special shout out to the rest of the comma, St. Lucia, Barbados, Granada, and Trinidad and Tobago. This breathtaking lineup of countries and their people are only matched by who is living deep within the waters of the Caribbean Sea, just off the shores of Dominica. A clan of about 400 whales who have been aptly dubbed the Eastern Caribbean Sperm Whales. Now, I could rattle off a laundry list of wondrous facts about these creatures. Stuff like how they have 20 to 26 banana-shaped teeth in their lower jaw, and each tooth can weigh up to two pounds. Their upper jaw contains no teeth but empty voids those lower teeth slide into. This creates a death grip on the giant squid that they catch. Speaking of which, they have the longest digestive system in the world, reaching up to 300 meters long, or just under a thousand feet. That's all contained in a body that can grow up to 40 to 60 feet in length. Most impressive of all, however, is their brain and how it's used to communicate. Here is where I'm gonna let a professional step in. <laughs> My friends, I'm going to fire up the old tube of you and play a video that's so goddamn informative, I'm going to play the whole goddamn thing. And if you'd like to watch along, just head on over to the Ubes and search sperm whales clicking you inside out. James Nestor at the interval. Once again, that's sperm whales clicking you inside out. James Nestor at the interval. And you'll see a video by the Long and Now Foundation pop up. Um, It features author and understandably sperm whale obsessed James Nestor speaking at the Long Now Foundation, which is a nonprofit based in San Francisco and is dedicated to fostering long-term thinking and responsibility. What a novel fucking concept. Um, Anyway, sit back, relax, and prepare yourself for sperm whale magnificence. Sperm whale can click at about 236 decibels. It's the loudest animal on the planet. Sperm whales can hear each other in the ocean from hundreds, even thousands of miles away. Some researchers believe that they're able to keep in contact with one another through these clicks on other sides of the planet. Uh, These clicks are so powerful in the water that they can blow out your eardrums easily and they could actually vibrate a human body to death. So when you're diving with them, it's a little sketchy. Um, What I'm gonna show you now is a video of some free divers that I ended up hanging out with. I wasn't with them during this expedition, but uh, I was um, about six months later, we went on a trip together and I had the same experience. So uh, the clicks you're gonna be hearing are not coming from a boat. They aren't coming from a camera. These are the whales clicking these guys literally from the inside out to see what they're all about. And um, uh, the clicks were so powerful that one of these guys uh, put out his hand to stop a whale from running into him. And his 
hand uh, actually was paralyzed for about four hours afterwards. So he learned not to keep out his hand in front of him when he was diving. This is an emerging discipline of research, and it's pretty sketchy. But um, this is what it's like. I'm, I'm not going to talk over this. Uh, we're going to play this kind of loud so you can really get an experience of what this is all about. There we go. Okay. You're going to notice the whale is going to flip on its belly. That's where it collects those echoes underneath its jaw. They don't use ears underwater. So he's getting a really good look at him right now. He's diving down. Okay, so I know what you're thinking. Why the hell would anyone want to do that? Um, I know that was pretty loud for all of us, but trust me, in the water, it's like four million times louder. And uh, once you're hanging out with the whales for a long time, this didn't happen to me, but it happened to these guys, their bodies started heating up from being pelleted with all of that energy after a while. Um, so again, uh, this is pretty sketchy stuff. It's strange to do. Um, but it's important to note that these guys are fascinated by whales. They don't necessarily want to free dive with them this closely, but they have to, because it turns out the only way to really study these animals up close is by free diving with them, by approaching them in your natural form and interacting with them in that way. Scuba doesn't work, it's too loud. Submarines don't work, same thing. Robots don't work. They freak them out. But when you free dive with them, it, this amazing paradigm shift occurs. And they not only don't swim away, but most of the time, the whales will turn around and welcome you into the pod. And sometimes they orient themselves vertically and do this very weird sort of new age thing around you as they're, <laughs> as they're clicking. It's extremely intense. So the next question you're probably asking yourself is like, why research sperm whales? Well, it turns out that those clicks you heard, they aren't just used for echolocation. Sperm whales and dolphins also use clicks for communication. And inside of those clicks is probably one of the most sophisticated forms of communication we've discovered on the planet. Could be more sophisticated than human language. Now, I know that sounds completely nuts to all of you. And it certainly sounded nuts to me when I first started researching this stuff a couple of years ago. But just consider a, a couple of things. The sperm whale brain is about six times the size of ours. Uh, this is a, a picture of sperm whales facing us head on. And that top thing is their nose and behind that is their brain. Now, sperm whales also have a neocortex. In humans, the neocortex is believed to govern higher level functions like conscious thought, future planning, and language. Well, sperm whales not only have a neocortex, but theirs is about six times the size of ours. Sperm whales also have spindle cells. These are long and highly developed brain structures that neurologists have associated with compassion, love, suffering, and you guessed it, speech. All of those things that make humans human and separate us from great apes. Well, uh, sperm whales not only have spindle cells, but have them in a far larger quantity than we do. And they've had them for 15 million years longer than we have. Okay, there you have it, my friends. The clicks and pops of the loudest animal on Earth who has been clicking and chatting for 15 million years and one whose brain contains the mechanisms capable of everything from compassion to speech. So, 
If you're thinking, damn, I wish we could understand what they could be saying to each other, you're not alone. Over the years, there have been literally hundreds of people working on it. And they just dropped a new study that's making waves. No pun intended. Let's get into it. Now, the talk you just heard happened in 2017. But from 2005 up until 2018, marine biologists, computer science engineers, PhD students, professors in linguistics, artificial intelligence nerds, fucking interns, sailors, and a plethora of other researchers from MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory and the nonprofit Project SETI have been organizing a spectacular feat off the shores of Dominica. Project SETI's acronym and honorable goal explain why. The Citation Translation Initiative has been using the one-two punch of, quote, advanced machine learning and state-of-the-art robotics to listen to and translate the communication of sperm whales in Dominica in the Eastern Caribbean. Our hope is that SETI's findings will show that technology can bring us closer to nature, end quote. Well, after 13 years of research, I think it's safe to say what they discovered has certainly brought sperm whales a hell of a lot closer. My friends, the equipment used to record the chatter of 400 whales included everything from custom-built toad hydrophones to what they called animal-born sound and movement tags. These are essentially recorders slash tracking devices that were, quote, deployed from a nine meter handheld carbon fiber pole that were attached to the whales using four suction cups, end quote, from their study titled Contextual and Combinatorial Structure in Sperm Whale Vocalizations. Anyway, if you'd like to see any of this beefy equipment, just head on over to our social media stuffs and tap on today's post. You'll uh, also see a handy diagram from this study illustrating how sperm whales produce these sounds. So, in regards to all the aquatic equipment, equipment used, researchers wanted to find ways to listen in on conversations between whales that were in no way impacted by the presence of a swimmer. And guess what? It fucking worked. The voices of at least 60 individuals were captured, and holy shit, they had a lot to say to one another. The team was left with 9,000 recordings. 9,000. And those recordings, well, to our ears, (laughs) you, you heard them. For us, it's kind of a mess. But for AI, it's no problem at all. From 2018 onwards, I don't think I need to mention that AI and machine learning have made some progress. And this progress is exactly what the team was looking for. My nimble business goose, all of those recordings were clickety clacked by various algorithms and what it found, drum roll please, thank you in the back, the team's machine learning program detected patterns in the sounds, enough so as to pick up on 156 distinct sentences. Did you get chills? <laughs> okay, wait, we can't call them sentences per se. I did that, I call them sentences. The researchers called them codas. Turns out sperm whales have a large repertoire of clicks. It's so large, the team has cataloged it as a sperm whale phonetic alphabet. When you string that alphabet together, you produce codas. Think of it like words of a sentence or letters in a word. And brace yourself, because just like with any language, there's nuances. The sperm whale uh, phonetic alphabet, (laughs) it isn't just composed of straightforward monotone clicks. It's fucking complicated. To help explain, I'm going to fire up another video, and yes, it's on the Ubes, and if you'd like to watch along, please search Exploring the Mystery Alphabet of Sperm Whales, and a 15-minute video from MIT will pop up. Now, I'm not going to play the whole thing. 
I am going to play about a minute or so, starting at 9 minutes 14 seconds. Here, we're going to hear um, PhD student Pratyusha Sharma explain what in the holy hell is going on with these codas. Buckle up. So Pratyusha, how do whales encode information in their clicks? So whales encode information in their clicks by varying how the clicks are positioned with respect to each other. So by varying the rhythm, which is how the clicks are placed between distances between consecutive clicks, by varying the overall duration of this packet of clicks, by also like gradually changing this overall duration over consecutive calls, and by finally adding additional clicks on top of these packets. So for each of these phenomena, we have different names. So the placement of the clicks, we call it rhythm. The overall duration can be clustered into a few fixed buckets, and we call these tempo. This gradual variation across calls in the overall duration, we call it rubato. And finally, this extra click that we've been talking about that occurs on top of existing coda types, we call it ornamentation. Well, this is so fitting because uh, we have heard whale songs, so it's really wonderful to use inspiration from music to describe the sound variations that make content uh, in, uh, in the codas that the whales exchange with one another. Well, you heard Pratusha right. Similar to human language and speech, sperm whales add detail to their codas or sentences. And they do this with rhythm or by adjusting the tempo, speaking quickly or slowly. They even adjust tempo mid-coda or what researchers called rubato. Sometimes they add an extra click at the end of a coda, which scientists called ornamentation, kind of like what the French do at the end of their sentences. God, all of this is so familiar. And I think the team over at SETI has achieved their goal of bringing sperm whales a little closer to home. But they're not done yet. You're probably thinking, well, we still don't know what they're saying to each other exactly. We know how they talk, but about what? Also, this study only covered whales off Dominica. Do sperm whales from other locations have different alphabets? Great questions. You are onto something. That is part two. Quote, in the future, researchers might be able to match vocalizations with specific behaviors. That may not produce an exact one-to-one -one translation from whale to human language, but it would be an amazing achievement all the same, said Diana Reese, a psychologist and animal behavioralist at the City University of New York, who was not involved in the project, to the Associated Press. Now, matching codas to actions would be extraordinary, but as biologist Shane Giro put it, researchers need to branch out and begin to focus on more than whales in just Dominica. Telling NPR, quote, if we only ever studied North American English-speaking society in the dentist office, we'd walk away with the fact that a key part of their communication system is the word root canal. We'd just be wrong, because we didn't have a comprehensive picture. End quote. Now, root canal is a rough example, Shane, but that was very functional, thank you. Let's continue to watch this space because maybe, maybe whales aren't talking about root canal, but they're actually talking about, quote, how important their grandmothers are, or how important being a good neighbor is, or the importance of cultural diversity in a society. That really resonates with people and can drive change in human behavior in order to protect the whales. End quote. Giro so wonderfully told NPR News. I'm not crying. I am not crying. After the break, we are leaving the largest tooth whales in the ocean for honeybees no bigger than your pinky. And we are sticking with language, but not in the traditional sense. Thanks to the honeybees' powerful sense of smell, they can tell us if lung cancer is present in a patient, and they can do so with extraordinary accuracy. You need to hear this study and how honeybees may single-handedly change 
our healthcare system. I'm not fucking around. Stay tuned. <laughs> Você que está ouvindo seu podcast, sabia que tudo que o Google faz tem a intenção de trazer impacto positivo? Como? O Jefferson da Tributei usou inteligência artificial para facilitar o dia a dia das empresas. Ele e milhares de empreendedores geraram mais de 188 bilhões com as plataformas do Google. E a Miriane? Se formou em UX com certificados profissionais do Google, criando o seu próprio negócio. Ela e 88% dos formados relataram avanços profissionais como promoção ou novo emprego. Tem que ser bom para todo mundo. Google. The Unbiased Science Podcast is devoted to objective, critical appraisal of evidence on health topics relevant to listeners' daily lives. I'm Dr. Jess Steyer, a public health scientist with expertise in public health policy, biostatistics, and advanced analytics. And I'm Dr. Andrea Love, an immunologist and microbiologist with expertise in infectious disease immunology, cancer immunology, and autoimmunity. And together, we are the hosts of the podcast. The goal of the Unbiased Science podcast is to dispel misinformation and misconceptions across an array of science and public health topics. We love to debunk myths and help arm our listeners with information so they can make evidence-based decisions. We hope you'll tune in to the Unbiased Science podcast, your trusted source for no nonsense, just science. New episodes air every other Wednesday, so make sure to mark your calendars. And we're back. We are so back. And my friends, we're going to take a minute to tip our hats to the goodest boys and girls who are out there saving lives. I'm talking about dogs. That's right. Thanks to their outstanding sense of smell and their ride or die loyalty to humans, dogs have been trained to help us identify a number of diseases or to alert their person of an oncoming episode. For example, They could alert owners of a potential diabetic seizure or epileptic seizure. Migraine service dogs can detect migraines by changes in the smell of a person's breath before an attack. Other trained dogs can pick up a scent emitted by narcolepsy patients. And people with Parkinson's disease may smell different years before they even have the disease, which could allow dogs to detect it early, allowing for treatment before symptoms become too severe. Dogs can also sniff out COVID-19, malaria, and a fucking number of other cancers, including bladder, breast, prostate, skin, ovarian, and yes, lung cancer. And lung cancer, my boisterous business goose, is the leading cause of cancer-related deaths around the world. Responsible for an estimated 1.8 million deaths in 2022 alone. Now, These goodest boys and girls provide us, provide us with a huge amount of support. But training them takes weeks and comes with a financial cost. And when lives are on the line, time is of the essence. So, who could possibly fill these little rubber doggy shoes and even take them a step further? If you're thinking, duh, honeybees, that is super random But you wouldn't be alone. Researchers from Michigan State University had the same exact thought. Quote, Insects have an amazing sense of smell the same way dogs do, said Dibajit Saha, an assistant professor in the College of Engineering and MSU's Institute for Quantitative Health Science and Engineering to msu.edu. Professor Saha is absolutely right. Scent is an extremely important part of how many insects communicate, especially honeybees. Quote, for them, it's a language, said the aptly named chemical ecologist Flora Gouzier of the French National Research Institute for, Sus for Sustainable Development. Uh, Flora said this to sciencenews.org. So, if you're asking, how? How do honeybees communicate? And how do they smell things exactly? They don't have a nose, do they? I am so glad you asked. Long, fuzzy story short, honeybees communicate via pheromones. And get this, bees can sense these pheromones through their antenna, which are equipped with specialized odor receptors called sensillas, or sensilla. 
it's already plural. Anyway, these babies are outstanding. Along with picking up pheromones to help identify fellow sisters in the hive and commands from the queen, quote, their sense of smell is so precise that it can differentiate hundreds of different floral varieties and tell whether a flower carried pollen or nectar from 500 feet away, end quote, from blackwaterbeekeepers.org. That is a talent. That is impressive. And it's a tool we fragile humans can certainly use. So join me, will you, at Professor Saha's lab at MSU, where we're joined with some members of his bee-loving team, Alicia Cox, Saha's former lab manager, and Michael Parnas, a doctoral candidate. They came up with a totally normal, not bonkers at all question. Can honeybees distinguish between the chemicals in the breath of someone who was healthy compared to someone with lung cancer? In sum, can they help us detect the biomarkers or chemical concentrations associated with lung cancer in human breath? And I know what you're thinking. I can see your face from here. How the fuck are we going to test this? (laughs) Are we going to like lock a bunch of lung cancer patients in a room and ask them to wheeze as much as they can and then release some bees? Like... No, that is a horrible experiment, dear God, but good try. Uh, Believe it or not, the team didn't need any humans whatsoever. Put a pin in this, we'll get to it. What they did need, present, however, were some actual foraging honeybees called Apis mellifera. They were purchased and shipped from the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University, and to keep them still for the experiment we're about to dive into, the team 3D printed what I can only describe as tiny medieval stocks. I mean, <laughs> that's what they look like to me. And I mean it in the nicest way. Please, you have to tell me what you think they look like. Drop whatever 15th century device you're holding and pick up your phone. Head on over to our social media stuffs and tap on today's post. Uh, Please swipe past the photos of all our whale friends, and uh, you're going to see one of 20 bees the researchers placed in these little um, stockades of sorts. Now, they did this for an important reason. An even tinier electrode needed to be placed in the scent region of its brain, which would then measure and record any patterns or changes in the bee's brain signals. Now, Once the live bee was squared away, Alicia and Michael had the task of creating synthetic human breath. They actually developed an airy recipe of sorts by mixing different levels of six compounds, including trichloroethylene and 2-methylheptane, nailed it, to create the chemical makeup of the breath of someone with lung cancer and a synthetic healthy breath mixture. That is... I ran out of breath saying all that. (laughs) So, what the fuck happened when they delivered different puffs of air to the insect's antenna? Drumroll, please. Thank you again. Brace yourself for this, my friends. Quote, When we mixed six lung cancer biomarkers at different concentrations to create synthetic lung cancer versus synthetic healthy human breath, honeybee population neural responses, were able to classify those complex breath mixtures reliably with exceedingly high accuracy. End quote. From their study, oh dear God help me, this is so long. Okay, from their study, precision detection of select human lung cancer biomarkers and cell lines using honeybee olfactory neural circuitry as a novel gas sensor. What I'm trying to say my delicious business goose, is that their phrase, exceedingly high accuracy, is putting it mildly. The bee's brain signals created a different recognizable pattern when smelling the two different breaths. After analyzing these patterns, researchers saw that the bees correctly distinguished the two types of synthetic breath 93% of the time. They were correct 93% of the time. That is... No one else is correct 93% of the time. (laughs) That's crazy. 
and it gets better. Not only were they able to detect cancer in the correct breath sample, they were, ab- they were able to do this at extraordinarily low levels. Quote, the bees could differentiate between minute changes in the chemical concentrations of the breath mixture, which is in parts per one billion. End quote. Yeah, like lung cancer was barely there and they were, they were able to pick up on it. Again, amazing. And again, it gets better. With the bees blowing this test out of the water and being like, NBD, cancer, I fucking see you, the researchers took this to the next level by asking if these bees could distinguish different types of lung cancer. Yeah. In this case, for this portion of the study, two types of cultures were grown. Excuse me. One culture called non-small cell lung cancer and another called small small cell lung cancer, each of which, long story short, has different morphologic and metabolic characteristics. Graduate student Autumn Le... Le- <laughs> yeah, these names. Graduate student Autumn McLean Svadova and undergrad Summer McLean Svadova whipped up these lung cancer cell cultures in airtight flasks with the help of Christopher Contag, who is director of MSU's Institute for Quantitative Health Science and Engineering. Okay, the plan was to uncover these flasks in front of our remarkably, remarkable bee friends and see if they could distinguish between the two types. Take one guess as to what happened. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The honeybees were also able to differentiate between different cancer cells and they were able to do this 82% of the time. They passed with flying colors, no pun intended. So what does this all mean for us? Well, Saha and the gang hopes this method of testing could be used on actual cancer patients' breath. And good news, we won't have to use actual bees. (laughs) Quote, Saha envisions this work will open the door for more biological and smell-based disease detection technologies. In the future, Saha's team plans to develop a non-invasive test that only requires patients to breathe into a device, and the sensor inside, based on honeybee brains, would analyze the breath and wirelessly report back in real time if the cancer chemicals are present." End quote. From msu.edu, and that's the NYPD. (laughs) Jesus. That's not necessary. And there you have it, my friends. A fucking affordable, fast cancer screening, hopefully one day soon. And this is all thanks to honeybees. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening, rating, subscribing. Telling your friends that, like, sperm whales have been talking for 15 million years. I run out of breath in, like, 30 minutes. It's, I'm going to go take a nap. Uh, tell them how honeybees are once again saving humans, like, every fucking day. They've got something new coming up to save us. And it's like, we really need to return the favor. And um, a bee-filled thanks to the folks over at Airwave Media, the podcast network to which WTI belongs, If you love this show, and you do, you love the other podcasts in this family. And please, stay interesting.